Hello everyone, FPL Raptor here and welcome back to another video on my YouTube channel. In today's video we have my Game Week 17 preview and we'll discuss things such as Fulham and Bournemouth players, which I never thought I'd say in an FPL video. We'll discuss what to do with Erling Haaland, we're going to talk about AFCON, the Asian Cup and the players on four yellow cards. If you do get any use out of today's video, please do make sure you like it, make sure to subscribe as well. But without further ado, let's jump into it. So the FPL season and the Premier League season has been very unpredictable thus far, but two teams that have performed very well recently, which we maybe wouldn't have predicted to do so, are both Fulham and Bournemouth. And very briefly at the start of this video, I just want to discuss, are there any assets that we can select from Fulham or from Bournemouth? Because the way that they're playing at the moment, we want to try and get some points from their players and their FPL assets have been really good options. So we're going to take a look at Fulham first. And what I've got is the data for the Fulham assets that I think are worth considering, mainly the ones that are starting pretty much every week. And I've only got the data actually from game week 13 to game week 16. Now that's only a four game week period. And I would always advocate trying to use a bigger sample size if possible, because one single big chance across a four game week period, uh, uh, sample size can massively skew the data. So I would always try wherever possible to try and look at the bigger sample size. But it really has been the last four weeks where Fulham have turned it up a notch and they've just been scoring goals for fun. So I want to look over this more recent sample size. Have there been any standout players when we look at the underlying data? Of course, you can just go on to the FPL site and sort by who has scored the most points. And I do have points per game on this table here. But we also want to take a bit of a deep dive into the data. When we're looking at the defense, probably Leno is the best bet from the defense because he makes so many saves. He is actually an unbelievably good goalkeeper as well. He's great at saving penalties and he's very good for bonus points too because his pass accuracy is very, very high. So Leno, I would argue, is the best defender to own. You could go for one of the centre-backs if you wanted to, but I think if you're going to go for a defender... I'd probably be willing to take a risk on one of the fullbacks. And I think I would probably go for Robinson just because he looks the most nailed of the three. So you've got Robinson, Castagna and Tete who are most likely to play. But Robinson looks the most nailed, even though I don't think he's 100% nailed because you could have Tete at right back and Castagna at left back. But I think Robinson's the most nailed and he's also got the best data at 0.15 non-penalty expected goal involvement per 90 over this period. So I do think at the moment, in my opinion, if you're looking for a defender, it probably is Robinson. But I've got a bit of a soft spot for Castagna. So there is always a decent chance that I'll recommend him. I do think it's Leno though. And I think if you're in the market for a goalkeeper and maybe you don't want to go for Dubravka because there are some potential issues associated with it. There are rumors going around that he's got a slight shoulder injury. Not that that will necessarily keep him out, but it does sound like Newcastle might be going after a keeper in January. So Leno could be the best long-term option. And he's still at the moment cheap enough to still justify that price tag. When we move on to the midfielders, we've got Kearney, Andreas, Willian, and Awobi. For me, it, it has to be Awobi. I mean, look at the underlying data here. Andreas and William putting up very decent data, 0.35 non-penalty expected goal involvement per 90 for Andreas and 0.42 for William. I don't mind Kenny, but I think he's probably got the lowest ceiling of all of them. So really, I'd be looking at Andreas and William. And whilst that data isn't bad for that price, and whilst William, when he's fit, and I should note that there is a small chance that he's not available for 17, whilst when he is fit, he is on penalties. And if he's not fit, it could be Andreas on penalties. I just think they can't compare with Awobi. And across the season not just across the last four game weeks. Awobi still has the best data. And his data across the last four is remarkably good. 0.79 non-penalty expected goal involvement is one of the best in the league. He's putting up 7.75 points per game and he looks relatively nailed as well. So I'm going to keep this nice and simple. If you're in the market for a midfielder and you're in the price bracket of around 5 to 5.5 million, I would be very, very interested in Awobi because the fixtures are pretty decent. He's got very, very good data. He's pretty nailed. And even like I said, across a larger sample size, the data is still about 0.5 non-penalty expected goal involvement per 90 this season. So there's very little to dislike about Awobi. And whilst I'm not expecting Fulham to continue scoring about five goals a game, I do think that the way that they're setting up at the moment, they will continue to score goals. So for me, Awobi is not only the best player for Fulham, but specifically the best midfielder. I do just want to give a shout out to the man on your screen though, Raul Jimenez, a player that we desperately wanted to start becoming an FPL option again, because if you've played FPL for a few years now, Raul Jimenez at Wolves before his injury was an absolute beast and an absolute FPL machine. And he started to find a bit of form recently. And you can see here, the data is also pretty good too. 0.55 non-penalty expected goal involvement per 90. The second best on this list behind Awobi. And he's actually 5.2 million. 
So for those of you that are looking for a cheap forward, maybe moving towards a 3-4-3 but don't have that much money for a third forward, or maybe you're looking for an eighth attacker that you can rotate into your team, Raul Jimenez could be the one. Again, looks relatively nailed at the moment, played 79 minutes per game over the last four. Good data. He's actually returning as well. We know when Jimenez finds that confidence, he is an exceptionally strong finisher. His conversion rate at Wolves before the injury was pretty good. So... To summarise, I'm going to keep it nice and simple. I think Robinson would be the defender I would go for, but I think Leno, if possible, would probably be the best option if you're looking for a Fulham defender or a player that is likely to keep clean sheets for Fulham. And then from the attack, I think if you're going for a midfielder, for me, looking at the data, it has to be a Wobi, but I would just keep an eye out on Raul Jimenez. I would love to know down below in the comments, are you interested in any Fulham players? So alongside Fulham, another team that have been very impressive are Bournemouth. And you could argue that Bournemouth have been even more impressive because it's been over a longer period of time. So what I've got here is the data from game week 10 to 16, because that's when Bournemouth have gone on this very, very nice run. But across the last six to eight game weeks, they are the best or second best defense in the league for expected goals conceded after Arsenal. So whilst I think Fulham have been a more impressive attack, and you can see, see they are putting teams to the sword, Bournemouth have been scoring goals and they are good going forward. But where they've been most impressive is their expected goals conceded and when you look at the fixtures that they've had they're not necessarily the best fixtures I, don't, I would argue that their best fixtures are yet to come across the next three game weeks so really really impressive from Bournemouth but they are good defensively good going forward and importantly they have good FPL assets as well because sometimes teams can be playing very well but they just don't have the assets in FPL due to pricing reasons or just maybe a lot of the goals being spread around the team but I think there are a couple of good defensive options and we know as well about the attackers so starting with the defense I do think it is Senesi and that's not just because he's got a 14 and 15 pointer in the last two game weeks yes he is actually returning but the underlying data has been really really strong across the last four and even between game week 10 and game week 6 16. He's putting up 0.21 non-penalty expected goal involvement per 90. The other thing that I like about him, as well as him being incredibly cheap and having good data, is he looks relatively nailed too. And what you don't want is a player to miss out at some point. And a lot of the other Bournemouth defenders, they've either got terrible data or they're a bit of a risk for minutes. So I like Senesi because he's basically got everything. I have put Smith on here because I think he started the last three and his data is decent. He's got decent expected assists at 0.13. So I, I guess you could mix it up if you wanted to, but I feel like that's just trying to go different for the sake of it. I think Senesi's probably the one to go for. Do I think he's worth bringing in? I mean, I, I don't think I could argue that he's not because he's cheap. They've got brilliant fixtures over the next three. And Bournemouth's data has been good, good enough for a long enough period of time now to suggest that they probably will continue keeping clean sheets. So absolutely no issue there for me at all. I do wonder if longer term he's going to be the best option because after the next three Bournemouth's fixtures do start to turn for the worst slightly but you never know I mean as a fifth defender or a fourth defender in your team rotating in and out if Bournemouth can keep this up he's going to be an absolute gem so I have no issue bringing him in when we're looking at the attackers I've got Semenyo, Christie, Tavernier and Solanke I like Semenyo he's cheap but a couple of issues the data hasn't been fantastic over this spell here I don't think he's fully nailed on in that Bournemouth team. And on top of that, he does go off to AFCON in game week 21. So if you are in the market for a very cheap forward and you can't afford to go any more expensive up to the likes of a Raul Jimenez, who I probably do prefer, then by all means go for it. But do bear in mind AFCON, bear in mind that data is not that great. And I do think there are better options from the Bournemouth attack. Christie is fine, but again, you can see the data isn't there. The reason that I don't mind him is he's very cheap. And on top of that, he is probably the most nailed player in that Bournemouth attack, maybe even more so than Solanke. But really, the two attackers, if you are interested, are Tavernier and Solanke. Tavernier's got 0.53 non-penalty expected goal involvement, which is very good. He's on pretty much all set pieces for Bournemouth too. And I know he says here 75 minutes per game. That was due to getting one rest. But I think largely his minutes are relatively secure. I do think there is the chance he gets the odd rest, but I would expect him to start most of their games. And when he is on the pitch, he creates a hell of a lot. And he's also got a decent amount of attacking threat too. So I do like him as an option. But realistically, if you are going for a Bournemouth attacker, I think it is all on Solanke. Yes, he's up to 6.6 .6 million now, but look at that data. Non-penalty expected goal involvement per 90 of 0 0.72. He's averaging 89 minutes per game as well. He is a brilliant option. And we'll discuss Haaland later in the video. If you don't have, or sorry, if you already have Watkins, who is one of the obvious replacements for Haaland, if you're looking to take him out, then Solanke, I would argue, is probably the second best option. 
that data is unreal. And it doesn't matter that he's playing for Bournemouth, that a lot of people say. Even if Bournemouth drop off a bit, we've seen Solanke can still maintain pretty good data. It doesn't matter if Bournemouth are only scoring one goal a game if that get goal tends to go towards Solanke. So... I really like him as an option. I think he is well worth the 6.6 .6 million. And I myself will be looking at ways to potentially get him into my team as well. So to recap, Sinesi, if you're going for a defender, is brilliant. Do I still think he's worth it? Yes, for the next three, but maybe less so longer term. Depends what sort of outlook you've got. Outside of that, I don't think there are that many options that I'd be interested in. I don't mind Tavernier, but I would probably be looking at Solanke myself. And I think he's an excellent option in FPL. So we can't do a Game Week 17 preview video without discussing Erling Haaland. Just to timestamp this video, because you may be watching it at any point, I guess, across the week. I'm recording this late on Monday evening, ready for a Tuesday morning upload. And at the time of me recording, we don't really have a definitive update on Haaland. What we know is that he was very much struggling. He could barely walk after the Aston Villa game, which meant that they obviously didn't want to risk him against Luton. And the quotes coming out from Pep make it look like he doesn't think he has much of a chance against Palace. But there have been a few quotes where he's hopeful, but he doesn't sound particularly optimistic. And he said, if not then, then maybe Saudi Arabia, and then obviously if not after that. But from an FPL perspective, obviously if he misses the Crystal Palace fixture in 17, he blanks in 18, it means he wouldn't be back until 19. So if he misses this week, you've basically got two fixtures without Erling Haaland, at least. And then I suppose, unless we get confirmation it's only minor, he could even miss more than that. So I guess there are three possibilities. One, we get some information that he's fine for 17, in which case you very obviously keep him. I think he's a great option. If we don't get that, though, we've got two possibilities. One, we just don't get a definitive update. Looks unlikely, but we don't get that confirmation. And I think if that's the case, it's very hard to sell him if we don't get confirmation, or at least we don't get some kind of leak that he's unlikely to play. It's difficult to sell without that. However, I think what is more likely is we're going to get either confirmation he's out, or we will get a leak which pushes us to believe that there is a very good chance that he's not available for 17. And then obviously you have two options based on that. You can either keep him or you can sell him. So I'm going to discuss that now. If at the time of you watching this, you know that he's not available, this still applies. If you know he is, then of course you can skip this section. And I guess the keep him and sell him points are pretty much the opposite of each other. So the pro for one is the con for the other, and the pro for what the other is the con for the one the other one. So they're basically the same points here. But the pros of obviously keeping Erling Haaland is firstly a very obvious one. It saves you two transfers because you are going to want 1 billion percent, unless he's not available then, Erling Haaland for Sheffield United at home in game week 20. It looks very unlikely, by the way, that that will be a double game week now, but the double game week will probably fall between game week 21 and 25 now for Manchester, Manchester City and Brentford. So you're going to want Erling Haaland from game week 20. So you're going to have to use one transfer to take him out, and then one transfer to bring him in in the space of four game weeks, which isn't ideal. And if you value a transfer at four points, that is eight points, whilst you might not have to take a hit, that you're going to have to use on transfers to take out and bring ha Haaland back in. So if you keep him, you get to save those two transfers. The second thing is, if you keep him, you're likely to have him for game week 19 versus Everton. Whereas obviously, if you sell him, you won't. Because you'll probably wait until game week 20 to bring him in. I guess you could move back from in 19, but that feels very, very short term. So one of the benefits is a lot of people, myself included, but also people that sell him, may not have Haaland for that Everton fixture. And whilst Everton have been better recently, it's still a fixture you would probably want to have Erling Haaland for. Another positive of keeping him is that it allows you to fix the rest of your team. I guarantee that you've got at least one or two flags in your team. Maybe you want to sort out your goalkeeper. Your defense is a bit of a mess. Maybe you want to bring in Solanke. Maybe you've still heard, held on to Mbermo and you need to sell him. So... If you use a transfer to take Haaland out now, yes, that would maybe give you some more money, but it also would mean that you can't probably use transfers elsewhere unless you want to take loads of hits. So it's kind of moving the transfers away from where the priority needs to be onto Haaland. But I guess if Haaland is out, you could argue that is a priority. So those are the pros of keeping him. But of course, the con is very obvious. You've got a £14 million asset, which is a huge chunk of your budget, just sat on your bench doing nothing. That is not a good optimal use of your funds. The second thing is you are likely to have a weaker team in blank game week 18. My team looks brilliant for blank game week 18. And that's not me boasting because my rank's not perfect. It's just to say that that is one of the major benefits of not only not having Haaland, but then having that money redistributed around your team. Because it means that you can have Trippier, you can have Watkins, you can have Son, you can have all of these players that you want to own for blank game week 18. So less likely to need a free hit. And even if you weren't playing to free hit anyway, you have a lot more money invested into your starting 11. The other con of keeping him 
is you're going to have to sell Son and Salah anyway in game week 20 and 21. So if you're going to have to sell Son and Salah anyway, and the replacements for Son and Salah, unless De Bruyne is back, are going to be a maximum of like Saka and Bruno, but more likely the likes of like Gordon, Palmer, Sterling. These players are so cheap that you are going to have the funds anyway to bring Haaland back in. So it's not like it's going to require loads of extra work to get Haaland back in and you're going to be priced out of him because you have to sell Son and Salah anyway. So those are the pros and cons of keeping him. Again, the pros and cons of selling him are very, very similar, but I'll just go back over them very briefly. A pro of selling him is that you get to redistribute the funds. You remove a £40 million asset, you bring in someone like Solanke or even a Raul Jimenez, and you are laughing. You've got as many as much funding as you could possibly want for all of the transfers that you want in your team. Again, you will have a stronger team for blank game week 18, because if you take out Haaland, you'll bring in Solanke with a good fixture probably, or Watkins with the best fixture in blank game week 18. If you don't have Son, you can move to him. If you want to bring in Kieran Trippier, obviously not this week, but for 18, you can do that too. So it will probably give you a much better team for blank game week 18. As I said, you already have a route back to him because you will have to sell Son and or Salah in game week 20 slash 21. Yes, you would have to sell them a week earlier than they go off to the tournaments, but you do have that easy route back to Haaland. Obviously, the negatives are the pros of the keep him. So you're guaranteed to have to use two transfers, which you're not only using a transfer this week, but you're booking in a definite transfer a little bit later on. The other thing is the forwards do stink. If you've already got Ollie Watkins, who if you don't, by the way, we'll discuss transfers in a second if you do take Haaland out. But Watkins is such an obvious one. But outside of that, there are issues associated with all of them. Even Solanke, who I love, a little bit short term. And also, I guess we don't know if Bournemouth will be able to still maintain the level that they are at the moment. And whilst he is on penalties, he doesn't get that many penalties. So he's not even an ideal replacement necessarily. So and outside of those two, I'm just there are just issues associated with pretty much all forwards. So you're selling Haaland, but... Are the replacements that good? Are you guaranteed to get the eight points that you feel like you've spent to take him out and bring him back in, in the replacement? I'm less sure. And also, it is difficult to sort out other issues. If you're using a transfer now to bring to take him out and another one to bring him in, you've got less transfers to use to sort out your defense, to bring in other players. So I guess the pros and cons, like I said, are the opposite of each other. And I, I'm not really going to give you a definitive answer here. I obviously, and I say this as someone that sold Haaland a long time ago in Game K, I would sell him if we have no conf if we don't have confirmation that he's fit and it looks likely that it will be out or if we get confirmation that he's going to be out. It just feels like a really good opportunity because you have that easy route back to him in 20. You've got two blanks in the next couple. I don't think the Everton fixture is perfect. And the other great thing about 19 is Salah's the best captaincy option, in my opinion, against Burnley away. So you wouldn't even captain Haaland probably in game week 19. So you've got two blanks if he's not available in 17 and then a fixture where you wouldn't captain him anyway. And then in 20, you've got the route back to him that you need. So I guess there is much less risk associated with, associated with that than there normally would be. But I suppose it is team dependent as well, because I've seen quite a few people that ha have like Archer in their team and they've maybe got like 3 mil in the bank or 2.5 mil in the bank. And they're thinking, if I want Solanke, I can get him. I've already got Watkins. What? And I've already got Salah. I've already got Son. I've already got Saka. What is selling Haaland going to do for me? And if you are in a position where you've got Watkins already, you've got a route to Solanke, which doesn't involve Haaland. You've got most of the midfielders that you would want. And maybe you're not interested in the likes of Trent Trippier, or you can maybe get to a Porro anyway. I guess selling Haaland doesn't really do that much for you. And I wouldn't sell Haaland just for the sake of it. If your team is in a position where you've got the players you want, you can get a good team for blank gaming 18 and you think that Haaland will be back for 19 or 20, then, then there probably is really no need to sell him. So I'm not going to talk you into it and say that the only way to do it is to sell him. But in most situations, if we don't get confirmation that he's fit for 17 and it looks like it could even go beyond 18, 19, then I, I just think it makes sense to sell him, especially because we don't have any money tied up in him. Like no one will have money tied up in Haaland because he's not risen in price by 0.2 million. So it doesn't matter. You're not going to lose money by selling him and buying him back. Whereas with a lot of players, if I sold Son now and then wanted to buy him back, I'd lose quite a bit of money, which makes it a lot more of a difficult decision. So I'll leave it there. Again, just to confirm, if you are going to sell Erling Haaland, I think Watkins is comfortably the best option. If you've already got Watkins, I don't see anyone outside of Solanke for the next three that gets close. I do think there is some justification to move for Alvarez simply because he is going to probably be starting again in the number nine role in the absence of Haaland. He'll be on penalties most likely, and he's still on corners and some free kicks. He's almost like Brian M. Burmo for Man City because he's got everything, good minutes, all of the set pieces, and okay data too. 
but he also does blank. And if Haaland's back in 19, you're only getting the Crystal Palace fixture with Alvarez. So I probably won't go there. And I do like Darwin, but the fixtures are starting to run out for Liverpool. And he, he's gone back to his old ways of not really converting his chances. So whilst I think he's got a good fixture in 17, and I don't mind the fixture in game week 19 either, I just think I, I would argue that Watkins and Solanke are slightly better options. So... I'll leave it there with Erling Haaland. I would love to know at the moment, let's say we get confirmation that he's not available for 17 or it looks like he won't be. What is your plan with Erling Haaland? Are you going to keep him or are you going to sell him? So if you missed my transfer plans video, you should go back and watch that and also tune into my team selection video, which will be live on Wednesday. But my team is a bit of a mess and specifically the defense. I've got Reese James, who's number one, Reese James, but also looking like he's injured. I've got Trippier and Taylor suspended. And then I have Simakas and Gehi with very difficult fixtures, not only this week, but going forward as well. So my defense is a nightmare. And I would arguably replace at least four of them if I had a, a wildcard or unlimited free transfer. So I myself am looking into the defenders quite a lot at the moment. And what I've tried to do is just list the best defenders in the game, taking into account everything. So what I actually did, I won't show you the notes because it was quite messy, but I almost did like a Venn diagram where I was looking at goal threat and assist threat. So expected goal involvement data. I was looking at fixtures, clean sheets, and nailedness. I Is the player going to play every day at game? And also a little bit of bonus points potential as well. So I was looking at all of these different factors and kind of ranking the defenders. And this is the list that I've come up with based on all of that. And obviously some of these players won't have particularly good of one or two of these, but maybe they're so good for some of the other ones that it means they are still a decent asset. But I would argue there are probably only two players at the moment that have everything, and that is Pedro Porro and Kieran Trippier. I'll start with Porro, comfortably the best defender to own in the game at the moment, and that's not just based on the fact that he did well in game week 16. It's just got everything. He's attacking data, great. Passing the eye test, bonus points potential, pretty high as well. Spurs' is clean sheet potential, probably not perfect. They have not been great defensively. And I think with the way that they're attacking, they will probably concede quite a few. But he's not got a terrible chance of clean sheet. The fixtures are there as well now moving forward. There's very little to dislike about Pedro Porro. I think he's such an obvious transfer in if you have the funds to do it. I probably don't need to convince you of that. And unless something miraculous happens with my team, I will be bringing in Pedro Porro as one of my transfers this week. Trippier is still in second because... Yes, he has made a lot of mistakes recently. And yes, he looks fatigued. And yes, Newcastle have a thin squad. They are struggling. But he is still has exceptionally strong data. Even when he's not playing well, the data is still there. Newcastle are still going to keep clean sheets. The fixtures are still there for Newcastle, especially over the next two or three. And... I mean, I just think he's a player that will continue to get points for you. Obviously, you can't bring him in in game week 17. So it will be from game week 18 onwards. But in my opinion... If you've got Trippier, I certainly wouldn't sell him despite the blank. I would find a way to bring another player in for one of your others. And if you are looking to buy him, I wouldn't be put, be put off bringing him in in Game Week 18. I think Trippier and Porro are just a little bit ahead of everyone else. And I know people think, well, what, what about Trent? I love Trent, but he is 8 million now, or over 8 million, I believe. Clean sheet potential is probably higher than Porro, maybe a little bit lower than Kieran Trippier, but Liverpool have improved defensively. My issue with Trent is mainly the fixtures. And I think the fixtures coming up are not very good for clean sheets for Liverpool. I can't see more than two clean sheets in the next seven or eight games for Liverpool. Yes, there is always a chance that they do pick up the odd one here and there. But for that price, we need him to continue to get the attacking returns that he is, the bonus points, and the clean sheets. And when you look at the attacking data, yes, Trent is at the moment just on top of most of the other defenders over the last four to six game weeks. But is he enough ahead of Porro and Trippier? to justify the amount of money you have to pay for him, especially again with the fixtures coming up. Because you have to remember, the last four to six games for Liverpool have been excellent. They're not going to continue at the rate that they are with clean sheets and also the amount of chances that they create. So I love Trent. Still a great option. If you have him, wouldn't sell him. But I don't think he's quite up there with Porro and Trippier for me. After that, I mean, it's up to you what you're really looking for here. In fourth, I do have Torres and Konza. Simply because they've got the fixtures, especially in blank game week 18, they have the best fixture of the bunch. And I like the fact that, again, a lot of us will probably be struggling defensively wise in game week 18. So having a strong player to play there is nice. After that, I also don't mind the fixtures for Villa. And we've seen Villa can keep a clean sheet at home against anyone. I mean, they've just kept a clean sheet against arguably two of the best attacks in the league in Man City and Arsenal. And they did it in some style against Man City too. So... Torres and Conza, for me, feel like very good bets because every home game you can play them with the confidence that, there's, confidence that there's a good chance for a clean sheet. Some of their away games coming up on paper look like possible clean sheets too, but maybe it's those weeks that you try and rotate them out. 
when we come to sort of attacking threat, they don't really carry that much. But believe it or not, Cons has got slightly greater attacking threat than Torres at the moment. He's also, at the time of me recording this, 0 0.2 million pound cheaper. So Cons may be a cheeky punt, but he does get the odd early sub. Not pre-60 at the moment, but it does worry me that at some point, Cons is more likely to get a rest than Torres. And I would hate for that to come in blank game week 18 against Sheffield United. So I feel like Torres probably just about justifies the extra price, despite the fact that he's attacking threat is slightly lower, simply because he will play every game, or at least it does look that way. So I think I would still edge Torres. And again, if the deadline was tomorrow, or let's say right now, I would be bringing in Pedro, Porro and Torres, because I already own Trippier and I can't afford Trent. I have put Gabriel on here because I actually think the, the chance for a clean sheet in game at 17 isn't that bad against Brighton at home. And Arsenal are still the best defense in the league. Yes, they just conceded a ton of goals to Luton. And yes, they just conceded to Aston Villa. But I think they largely dominated that game against Aston Villa. And against Luton, they actually only conceded 0 0.5 XGC. So it was a couple of goalkeeping mistakes, a couple of defensive mistakes as well, which led to the goals. So I think that people are maybe forgetting how good the Arsenal defence are. And they are still worth investing in for me if you don't own them. So, very, like I said, Poro is a very, very obvious transfer for me. But that second transfer, which I'll probably going to make on my defence, is likely to be one of Torres or Gabriel. And I am tempted to still bring in an Arsenal defender. If you've got double Arsenal defence at the moment... I wouldn't be selling them. I think there are much bigger issues to address in our teams than double Arsenal defence. I'd definitely be keeping them in my opinion. And then in sixth, I do have you doggy, but do remember that you doggy is on four yellow cards. And the reason that he's in sixth and not up there with Porro is he just doesn't compare to Porro. I know he's just got an attacking return in game at 16, but I mean, he's just not getting into the positions that Porro is. The data's not there to support it. And I also think he's, if one of them is likely to get a rest, it's more likely to be you doggy than Porro. So whilst he is cheaper than Poro, quite a bit cheaper actually, I still think Pedro Poro is comfortably a better option. And I'm not sure with the with the chance of a clean sheet for Spurs, I'd be that tempted to double up on Poro and you doggy. I think I'd rather go for a Villa or an Arsenal defender alongside Poro. Outside of that, you do have some other options. You've got Liveramento if you want to trust the Newcastle clean sheet. Mikalenko or Branthwaite, obviously, once he serves his suspension. Everton just continue to keep clean sheets. They're very good for defensive data this season. You could go there. Harry Maguire still looks like he could be decent. Obviously, conceding three at home to Bournemouth isn't ideal, but Manchester United aren't the worst defense in the league. A bit of attacking threat, pretty cheap. You could go for Castagna or Robinson. We've already discussed them and Senesi as well in the Bournemouth and Fulham sections. Colwell, probably the Chelsea defender that I would go for, but I'm not overly convinced by it. He was benched again in 16. And yes, Reese James being out might mean that Dezassi's a little bit more nailed, but I'm not sure I'd be that interested in the Chelsea defense. They don't look great. Very difficult to predict minutes. And then obviously you could go for a Man City defender if you want to. But I would go for one of these six. I think Poro's the obvious one. Outside of that, I would go Aston Villa, Arsenal, you doggy, or just take a punt on one of the cheaper options. So guys, I thought I'd just update you on the players that are on three and more, specifically four yellow cards and obviously at risk of suspension. In case you are not aware of the threshold, the team that the player plays for has to have played 19 games. So including the 19th game for the threshold to then increase to 10 yellow cards. So for most teams, that will be from game at 20 onwards. But for Man City and Brentford, it will be from 21 on, onwards. And then, yes, yeah, so I think it's just Man City and Brentford that it will be shifted one game week. And so a lot of these players, I've tried to highlight the ones that are either popular already or players are looking at bringing in. I'm not going to go through all of them in loads of detail, but three yellow cards, Trent, Porro, Watkins and Darwin are the four that stand out to me. Poro, if he picks up another yellow card soon, that's a bit of a worry. But considering there are only a few games now left to play until the teams have played 19, it, you'd, you'd probably need them to pick up a yellow card next week for them to be a, a real risk for picking up five yellow cards if they're currently on three. So that wouldn't put me off Trent, Poro, Watkins or Darwin, but I guess something to just monitor. When we look at four yellow cards, though, lots of popular players, Senesi and Robertson, two players that I've mentioned already, and I probably should have mentioned this in the Fulham and Bournemouth section. In all honesty, I kind of forgot. But these are two players that are, are on four yellow cards. And I, I kind of selected them as the two best defenders to own from Bournemouth and Fulham. But maybe this puts you off slightly, especially when there are so many other good defenders to own. And for a lot of us, money probably isn't an issue. Maybe this puts you off bringing in those two. Or maybe you go for 
other defenders from those clubs. Udogi, like I did say in the defender section, is on four yellows. When we look at midfielders, McGinn and Decore are two players that aren't overly popular, but if you are looking to bring in those cheaper assets, especially ahead of blank gaming 18, maybe this puts you off slightly. Sterling and Palmer, both on four yellows. Sterling's been on at four yellows for a couple of weeks now. Obviously, Palmer picked up his fourth yellow in game 16. Would I now avoid Palmer? Probably not. But it is slightly worrying, right? They've got to now to go three games without picking up that fourth yellow otherwise, or that fifth yellow. Otherwise, they will be suspended. But I think Palmer's such a decent option at that price that I would still be tempted. But I suppose there are other cheap options that you could go for, such as an Awobi. So maybe this does put you off slightly. And then Huang... Not only going off to the Asian Cup in game at 21, but of course he is also on four yellows. But Huang has been on four yellows for about three or maybe three or four weeks now. So maybe this wouldn't put you off too much. And it is worth noting, these players would know that they are on four yellows. That doesn't always matter. I mean, Bruno's just picked up a fifth yellow before Anfield. That's a terrible, terrible thing to do. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to no longer make fouls and they're not going to pick up yellows, but they are aware of this. And some players will avoid, especially attackers, making the challenges that will lead to yellow cards. So that is the list. Or that's not the full list, but the players that are most notable. Let me know at the moment, by the way, how many players in your team are on four yellows? Is it bad? And could you be in a really bad position for blank gaming KT? Because a lot of us this week, like I've already got Trippier and Taylor are now suspended. Like, it can happen where in a single week, you lose two or three players due to suspension. So just keep an eye on this. So don't worry, I'm not being cheeky and just repeating content. But very briefly, I just wanted to remind you of the players that are going off to the Asian Cup and AFCON, which I did show you, I think, a couple of weeks ago now. A couple of game weeks ago, which is probably only like seven or eight days ago. But these are the players of note that are off to the Asian Cup and AFCON. I've selected or highlighted the four players, I think, that are in most teams, which is Son, Huang, Salah, and Kudas. Outside of that, none of the players are really that highly owned, but obviously you yourself may own them. And it is worth checking because I have seen teams that maybe have the likes of Kabore, Agurd, Ben Rahm, oh, sorry, not Ben Rahm, but Semenyo, maybe they've got Onana in goal. And all of a sudden you are looking at kind of five or six players that are off to AFCON and the Asian Cup. And if that is the case, maybe just start to think about the transfers that you might need to make because you obviously can't make all of these in game week 21. But the real reason I wanted to bring this back up is I just saw this graph on Twitter from Rob T FPL, which is absolutely fantastic. It was actually exactly what I was looking for. So do go check it out on his Twitter. But it's kind of the, the game weeks that the players will miss based on how far they progress through the competition. So what you can see here is if the players at AFCON and the Asian Cup are knocked out in the group stage, they may well only miss game week 21. That's not definite. They could still miss game week 22, but there is a chance that they're back for 22 and they'll almost definitely be back for 23. So we're saying that these players will be out from game 21 to 24, but there is the possibility that you keep some of these players, especially if they do not look particularly likely to progress out of their group, or you have a prediction of some kind that they won't. Maybe it's worth holding on to them, especially if you've got some money tied up into them. I suppose the issue that is that the likes of Son and Salah are very likely to make it out of their groups and also progress throughout the competition. So I'll let you look at the graph. Feel free to pause it and look at the different, obviously, stages that you can progress to. I suppose it is worth noting that teams that progress to the semi-finals and finals and obviously win the tournament do have a chance of missing all the way up to game week 25 and may not be back until game week 26. So that is a slight concern. And I did say this, that the teams that win may go on a parade in their home country. And if they do win and they have some celebrations, the managers may leave them out for game week 25. So it may well be someone like a Salah could miss all the way from 21 to 25 and not be back until game week 26. This is a lot of hypothesizing, but this is, I just suppose to say that it doesn't necessarily mean that every player that goes off to these two tournaments will be missing until game week 24. We may get some of them back a little bit sooner. So guys, there we have it. We covered a lot in this Game Week 17 preview. And you, if you did get any use out of today's video, can I please ask you to subscribe? We are trying to hit 110,000 subscribers before the end of the year, which is extremely optimistic. But if everyone that is watching right now subscribed, we'd probably already hit it. So please do so. And also smash a like as well. And until next time, which will be my team selection video, thank you very much for watching. Cheers. Bye-bye.